Hi, Ian Anderson here. The Aquila album marks a, a departure, really, from straight-ahead rock album styles and heavy guitars to a, a very dynamic mixture of big riffs and aggressive music through to singer-songwriter acoustic pieces, which um, in many ways marked, for me at any rate, the beginning of a, a confidence about doing songs that were in a more intimate setting. And, and often, as an album, as a whole, it, it was uh, social documentary, social realism, and uh, touches on subjects of the everyday street scenario, people in a, a landscape. The title track, Aquila, wasn't the first piece to be written for the album, but it, it came fairly early on in the, in the process and was based on a, a photograph that uh, my first wife, Jenny, presented to me when she was studying photography in London and came back with a picture amongst several that she'd taken of homeless people in uh, South London living under railway arches. And I was struck by the poignance poignancy of a particular photograph and said let's write a song about that and I don't usually write songs together with other people but this one came about more or less by illustrating via her memory of the character that she'd photographed a, a, a series of little vignettes just written down a few words at a time and then together we put that into the lyrics of a song and the, the music, as I recall, probably came after the lyrics, but soon after. And I remember writing the, the opening riff, ba 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 bum as a, a loud electric guitar piece. But of course, I was at that time in a, in a hotel room in the Midwest of America, and I phoned Martin Barr in his room and said, come over, I've got, got this new song, maybe we can just work on it together. So he came along with his electric guitar, no amplifier, just a feeble, dee, 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 almost inaudible, and I played him the, uh, the riff and the chords on acoustic guitar and said, this is your part. And I don't think he really understood that my idea was not a gentle acoustic thing, it was to be a full-on heavy rock riff. And, and indeed, it was a very memorable one, and also highlighted by Martin's great guitar solo in the middle of that, as witnessed by one Jimmy Page when we were recording the album in uh, Island Records' Basing Street studio. And uh, Jimmy popped into our studio. They were, Zeppelin were downstairs, and uh, Jimmy came in and uh, watched that little bit of the proceedings when Martin did his guitar solo live in the studio, knowing that Jimmy was watching him. Pretty scary stuff. We didn't uh, return the favour because we were far too shy to go and intrude on the Zeppelin recording sessions. <laughs> Thank you. 
sun streaking cold An old man wandering lonely Taking time the only way he knows Leg hurting bad As he bends to pick a dog at He goes down to the bar and warms his feet Feeling alone The armies of the road Salvation at the mode And a couple of tea I quell on my friend Don't just start away uneasy You poor old son, you see Aqualung, my friend, don't you start away uneasy. You poor old sod, you see, it's only me. Cross-eyed Mary. It's a weird one, but again, it's it's about people in a landscape. It's it's about a girl, a woman maybe, who's uh, not to put too fine a point on it. Someone prepared to sell herself for favours, and uh, something that I just made up because uh, I have no personal experience of ladies of the night, other than seeing them from a distance <laughs> and this particular one was a was an uh, imaginary woman probably flawed in some people's eyes by being cross-eyed and uh, but nonetheless i suppose attractive in some way to, to to men who wanted to pay for her favors and it it draws together i suppose a lot of stereotypes it's probably not really a 
politically correct kind of song. And there are, there are quite a few of those on the Aqualung album now that I think of it. That if if uh, if I was to write those today, I might just moderate some of the the um, descriptive nature titles names just to soften it a little bit because it in some ways does does dwell too heavily on stereotypes and as in uh, working ladies or working gentlemen for that matter stereotypes are always a little dangerous to to rely upon when conveying a message but this one anyway she was a cross-eyed lady of the night which makes her in my book rather more interesting Cheap Day Return was a song written about 
a brief visit up to Blackpool, where my father was quite seriously ill in hospital at the time, and not knowing whether he was going to make it, I, I jumped on a train and went up to, to visit him from London. And we, uh, we only spent, I guess, half an hour together in a, a ward in a hospital, and it seemed like he was going to pull through and was being well looked after. And uh, as you did in those days, uh, or even in these days when I'm allowed to travel on a train again, you would buy, uh, if you were a canny Scot like me, you would probably tend to buy the cheapest possible ticket. So I bought a cheap day return to Blackpool, which meant basically it was uh, pre-bought, pre-paid, and I had to stick to those train times, which meant I was really only going to be in Blackpool for a very short period of time before jumping on the train again in Blackpool North Station and heading back down south again. But the train um, stopped, or not stopped, I had to change trains, in fact, in Preston, a town in the north of England where I stood on one platform and went to another platform and stood there in the bitter cold, stamping my feet to try and keep warm. Hence the words on Preston, platform, do your soft shoe shuffle dance. And it's a, it's a little ode to my father and perhaps more importantly to the the nurses looking after him in hospital. And he, he did come home and did live a few more years after that. So it was a, a nice, memorable and very short little song. On present platform, do your soft shoe shovel dance. Brush away the cigarette ash that's falling down your pants. And then you sadly wonder, does the nurse treat your old man the way she should? She made you tea as for your autograph. What a laugh. Quite often, playing live on stage, I do Cheap Day Return and Mother Goose back to back as a little, a little pair of, of allied songs. Um, different subjects, Mother Goose was really predicated on some of those summer walks around Hampstead Heath, a public parkland in the north of London, where in the summer you'd find all kinds of people in the, from the dying days of the hippie times through to um, those just out exercising, having a good time. People would kind of dress up and be uh, endowed with the, the, the blessings of, of the summer sun. And, and I remember as being a pageantry of colour. People were wearing lots of colourful clothes and fondly I imagined uh, a pantomime character, Mother Goose, and foreign tourists and other characters that populate that song to, to be um, part of a, an almost Lowry-esque depiction of little matchstick figures, very colourful in a, in a landscape, but um, little, little tiny uh, moments of, of fun. And it, it is indeed a, a kind of slightly surreal, but nonetheless uh, interesting pastiche of, of topics and, and People probably scratch their heads listening to it, thinking, who is Johnny Scarecrow? Why is he doing his rounds? <laughs> For the life of me, I can't remember. <laughs> She was screaming And 
a foreign student said to me, was it really true? There are elephants and lions too in Piccadilly Circus. Walk down by the bathing pond to try and catch some sun. Saw at least a hundred schoolgirls sobbing into handkerchiefs as one. As a schoolboy And a bearded lady said to me If you start your raving And you're misbehaving You'll be sorry And the chicken fancier came to play with his long red beard and his sister's witch to drive the lorry. Back down by the button green, I popped him in there. Which he won't to get back, stole it from a snowman. As I did walk by Hampstead Fair, came upon Mother Goose. So I turned her loose as she was screaming. Wondering aloud, one of those rare occasions when I write something approximating to being a love song. And I'm not very good at that sort of stuff. I'm not really a heart-on-sleeve kind of guy. I'm more of a, an observer, um, more of a social realist who sees things and wants to translate them into music and words to paint you a picture in musical terms of something that I see, rather like characters populating a theatrical stage. But this one, Wondering Aloud, it, it, it's a personal, imagined kind of a song in which uh, um, I guess it's a waking up in the morning kind of a song, making a cup of tea kind of a song. And rather poignant and suitably decorated. I think I did two takes of the song, that was it. Just, just two takes on my own in the studio at Basing Street in London. And... Um, put my guitar down and listened to them and said, OK, that one's the one. It was just straight through, no edits or anything. But it was just an acoustic guitar and a voice, so it um, it had a little bit added to it in the way of uh, some piano from John Evans and a bit of bass from the novice bass player, Geoffrey Hammond. And then I thought it would be rather nice to hear a string quartet. So... I contacted 
uh, an old chum, David Palmer, who'd worked with Jethro Tull even as early as 1968, doing orchestral and other instrument arrangements. And he'd done a, a great string quartet piece for a song um, back in, at the end of 68, called uh, A Christmas Song. And so, in a way, we reprise that idea of it being a little relatively solitary acoustic piece, but with the warmth of a string quartet, which makes it one of those early songs where I think uh, we did we did a good job bringing together the the elements of a classical string quartet with uh, folky pop music, or whatever you would like to describe it as being. Wondering aloud, yeah, it's one, one of the few, one of the few love songs ever in my repertoire. Wondering aloud how we feel today. Last night set the sunset My hand in her hair We are our own saviors As we start Both our hearts beating light Into each other Wondering aloud Will the years treat us well? As she floats in the kitchen I'm tasting the smell here Of toast as the butter runs Then she comes Spilling crumbs on the bed And I shake my head And it's only the giving that makes you What you are Up To Me is another of those uh, walking down the street kind of a songs and seeing things and imagining people. Not so much imagining people, seeing real people, but imagining what their backstory is. Who are they? Where do they come from? What do they do? And I, I think probably because I spent a lot of time um, as a child and then as a, as a teenager at, at art school, drawing and painting and trying to see things with the observer's eye. I mean, also in photographic terms too, because I was always keen on photography, even, you know, as a child. And I think what I do is I try to see with the eye of, uh, of an artist and turn it around into the musical descriptive way that is so much more immediate than painterly arts when it comes to communicating something to an audience. I mean, it's here, it now, it's live, and you perform it live on stage, so it has a, an immediacy that you can never really capture in the, the slowed down process of making visual arts in a, in a painter's studio. So, uh, up to me, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, another of those street songs. Tennis. 
this club inside Trouser cuffs hung far too wide Well, it was up to me Eyes down on your bicycle You know it feels like an icicle The yellow-fingered smoky girl Is looking up to me Hip. Half of bitter bread and jam And if it pleases me I'll put one on your man <laughs> When the copper fades away The day glow pirate sings at last And if I laughed a bit too fast Well, it was up to me Take you to the cinema And leave you in a wimpy bar You tell me that we've gone too far Come running up to me We got onto side two and the, the opening track, My God, which I, I think may well have been the first song that was written for the Aqualung album. And it was actually performed live on stage sometime, some months before we actually got to, to record Aqualung, which was definitely late on in the year. But I remember doing My God in the summer of the, of the, the year before in 1970, and uh, at least in America. And it had slightly changed lyrics. But it was it was always a dramatic piece and a bit of a, a critique of organised religion. It's not that I have anything really against organised religion, but I think you've got to question the, the validity of people who use religion to, uh, you know, for self-aggrandisement, to, to make themselves look powerful and important and exercise some control over their flock. And... Um, as a as a child and then as a teenager at grammar school i you know certainly had my criticisms of the way religion was taught to impressionable young people like me and um felt that there was a song in there the song was not the song of a 21 or 22 year old adult the song was a song of a 14 year old boy because i try and express in the song some of the some of the criticism some of the the motives that I that I had for criticizing religion that I recall as a fourteen year old um, doing doing the inevitable uh, scriptural lessons and and uh, occasionally questioning the word of the Bible, much to the annoyance of headmaster and uh, religious instruction teacher, the Reverend David Luft, who was a a rather cruel man, as I recall. I mean, I don't think it was his fault. He just was never cut out to be a teacher. He was someone who I think found it uncomfortable being with a a school full of boys, a boys' grammar school. He, he didn't enjoy teaching. He didn't enjoy really the, the, uh, the communication part of it. He was a bit of a failure on that front, really. But, um, you know, I, I guess if I was to meet him today, long dead though he is, you know, I would try and find the, the soft spot between us and uh, forgive him for um, some of the unpleasantness and cruelty that he did intend to, did tend to inflict on others, perhaps not always knowingly, but he was uh, not the nicest guy. So 
Well, all of those things infuse that song and the lyrics and the, the, the drama of the opening acoustic pieces with piano and acoustic guitar through to the, the crashing in of the big riff. That's very much part of what Aqualung as an album is about. It's about dynamics and extremes musically. And again, lyrically speaking, I might just modify a, two or three words in the whole text today in order not to be misunderstood as... Um, as, it, as I was with that particular song back in 1971 when they, they burnt copies of uh, Aquila in the southern states of the United States because they thought it was uh, sacrilegious and a huge offence. And um, mainly I think the, the positive criticism that I had for the song tended to come from the other side of the religious um, professionals many of whom wrote to me, you know, vicars, rectors, people of all faiths, really, who who said, yeah, we, we, we get it, we understand what you're talking about here, and uh, they, 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 they got the message. Um, but uh, there were those that just uh, related it strictly to the hardcore biblical stance and felt that it was... Uh, a little untoward <laughs> as a piece of rock music, but uh, I got away with it. Nobody got hurt, as far as I know. Certainly, I'm, I, I escaped intact so far. <laughs>
the graven image you know who with his plastic crucifix he's got him fixed confuses me as to who and where and why as to how he gets his kicks he gets his kicks confessing to the Hymn 43, in keeping with one or two other things on side two of the Aqualung al album, it, it has a, uh, obvious references to Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, or in this case really Jesus Christ being, uh, being perhaps held up to be something that maybe he might have been a little uncomfortable with. We can never know. Uh, others wrote his biography and his many translations over the years, so we can only guess at what Jesus of Nazareth would have made of his uh, elevation to to such uh, a universal height in, in terms of uh, religious power um, and the power of that narrative, the story of the New Testament and the the Jesus chapters, which is something that has, has empowered so many people. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit um, like, without sounding condescending, I'm trying to be sympathetic and sound a little bit uh, understanding of the, of the huge weight placed upon the historic shoulders of Jesus. Tough gig, almost as bad as being the Pope, really. A father high in heaven Smile down upon your son yeah. Was busy with his money games oh, His women and his guns oh, Jesus saved me
loved the little short things, the little non sequiturs of, of music where you you just have this tiny thing that lasts 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it might be. There is no before, there is no after, it's just a tiny little glimpse of here and now encapsulated into this very narrow time frame. So um, it has a rather enigmatic but nonetheless nice little lyric that uh, does have an optimism about it, I think, um, but also a rather gloomy side too. It, 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 it goes from, covers all that negative and positive stuff in this almost just one sentence of lyrics. Um, yeah, it is enigmatic. And I, I like to think I'm quite good at being enigmatic. <laughs> it, uh, it, it comes quite easily to me. Well, the lush separation enfolds you And the products of wealth Push you along on the far wave Of their spiritual sundying selves And you press on God's way to your last dime as he hands you the bill and you're spinning the slipstream tied to some reasoning paddle right out of the mess and you paddle right out of the Always an unpopular thing to talk about because people get their knickers very readily in a twist if you talk about population issues. But growing up in the 70s, it seemed quite obvious that we were on a real level of growth in terms of global population. And even back then, if you were paying any attention to issues like food production, famines, to, to the degree to which I don't think the term globalization was used back then, but all of what that entails today, we were entering into a world that was just colossal in terms of industry, commerce, greed, banking, investments, and uh, all of the trappings that come with, with a lot of people, a lot of mouths to feed, and a lot of, a lot of people to buy products. So I wrote the song very, carefully, I think, to, to talk about that runaway train of population growth. <clears throat> I'm not passing any criticism on those who choose to have large families, or indeed those who choose to have no family at all, or limit it to one or two children. It, it, that's not the point of this. The point is, I think we have to accept that the reality of the world today is an unfettered population growth, perhaps to become tempered by one great socially relevant condition, which is that women educated in the last 30, 40, 50 years have made more knowledgeable choices about family sizes, whether to have children and if so, how many. And so population in the, dare I call it, the Western world has become tamed to a large degree and even countries like Italy, for example, where within the 
structure of the Catholic, the Catholic faith and the tendency not to approve of uh, birth control. Um, but nonetheless, population has has uh, has stabilised completely there. In fact, th through migration, somewhat reduced, as it has in many countries in Europe. And women more and more often choose to have one child, maybe two, quite often no children at all. They value their education, their careers, the opportunity to to take their place as, as equals um, in society. And that, that seems to be the major factor in slowing things down. But uh, you could toss in the odd pandemic or two as another uh, potential reason that maybe in 20, 30 years from now, we might see the population of planet Earth stabilize somewhere around 12 or 13 billion. But here's a sobering thought that uh, I was born in 1947. And in my lifetime so far, the population of our little fragile planet has increased, not by 50%, not by 100%, it has increased to be slightly more than three times as many people living here as there were when I was born, in one man's lifetime, more than tripling the population of our planet. So we, we, have, we, have, a, we have a big job in trying to, trying to create levels of equality, to feed those people, to, to cope with a, a real jungle of, of folks. It's, um, probably can be done. How long it can be sustained for is really up to us. Let's see if we can manage it. Just 
the last song on the Aqualung album, which I think intentionally was called Wind Up as a, as a, as a final song for the album, is one that begins with the lyric, when I was young and they packed me off to school and taught me how not to play the game. That's, again, I'm going back to my, my childhood days of, of being, uh, I suppose, subject to the uh, authoritarian regime of being at a, a grammar school that pretended to be a public school. Public school in the English term being a private school and very old fashioned and traditional. Boys were caned, boys were beaten, not just by middle aged men, the teachers, but, but by senior boys in the school had the right to, to cane and beat small boys. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and, and it happened. But um, you know, all of that still is part of my, my growing up, part of my sideways glance towards education my sideways glance towards religious education. But in many other ways, I wouldn't have wanted to miss that because it's given me a sense not only of a degree of anger, a, a degree of rebelliousness, but also a degree of understanding as to how people will use the degree of authority given to them, whether, whether they're senior prefects at a school or whether they're teachers. It's... Um, Having that authority is not always welcome to those who have to do it. And I, I, I rather feel that many of them probably regret the way in which they utilise that authority and the bravado with which some of them would wield a, a gym shoe or a cane on small boys who were 11 or 12 years old and probably rather terrified in the experience. So I, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change it, but uh, you, you learn both the good and the bad, and, and those are some of the thoughts I suppose I put into a, uh, what sounds like a rebellious put down of the, uh, the school system. But um, in a way, I, I, I think I value that, and maybe would have written the song a little bit differently with the wisdom of my years <laughs> that I did back in 1971. school and they taught me how not to play the game I didn't mind if they groomed me for success <laughs> or if they said that I was just a fool so I left there in the morning With a guard tucked underneath my arm The half-assed smiles And the book of rules And I asked this guard a question And by way of firm reply He said, I'm not the kind you have to wind up on Sundays So to my old headmaster And to anyone who cares Before I'm through I'd like to say my prayers I don't believe you You had the whole damn thing all wrong Is not the kind
when I was young and they packed me off to school and they taught me how not to play the game I didn't mind if they groomed me for success or if they said that I was just a fool so to my So that brings us to the end of the Aqualung album in all of its glory and uh, and all of its uh, variety of of sounds. The I, I suppose we should remember that this was a particular um, band album that didn't always feature all of the band, at least in the the recording process in the studio. Quite a few of the songs I just recorded on my own, but the ones that we did as a band, which were you know amongst Jethro Tull's best heavy rock songs, you know, they are to, to this day still part of the, uh, the performance live set on and off as they come and go from the, from the typical uh, set list. And I, I think looking back on it, it's probably one of the most important albums for me as a songwriter, for Martin Barr as a guitar player, because he was really, really beginning to find his feet at that time. As a as a soloist and a and having that ability to convey the the drama of the Les Paul guitar, which is what he played back then, and uh, Jeffrey Hammond, whose first album it was, um, having just joined the band about three weeks before we started recording, and uh, with with no experience really at all of of, um, of uh, or at least no recent experience of playing the bass guitar, and it had to be taught from the word go really song by song and, um, and then to our amazement once he'd got all of that in his head he became probably the most dynamic and expressive and entertaining bass player that we've ever had entertaining because he was a great stage character but he was entertaining also because he did play all the right notes all of the time he hardly ever made a mistake Good stuff, Jeffrey. <laughs>